द गोल्डन हनी कॉम बाय कमला मार्कंडिया कैरेक्टर्स समरी एनालिसिस हेलो एंड वेलकम टू द डिस्कोर्स द गोल्डन हनी कॉम वॉज द नाइन्थ नॉवल रिटन बाय कमला मार्कंडिया दैट वॉज पब्लिश इन नाइनटीन It is a historical realistic fiction novel that presents the condition of the Indian princely states under the influence of the British Raj during the period spanning from 1850 to 1947. During that period, 3/5 of India was directly under the British administration, while 2/5 comprised the princely states ruled by autocratic Indian princes who were bound with Britishers in various types of treaty relationships, ranging from subordinate alliances to vassalage. The Governor General was overall in charge of princely states in India as a representative of Queen Victoria. The novel is divided in three parts along with a prologue and an epilogue. The prologue depicts the urgency of the British administration to increase their dominion over the Indian subcontinent by hook or crook. The British government faced defeat and ignominy during the American War of Independence and that pushed them to increase their grip in the East, especially in India. After hearing about the defeat of the British forces in America, Warren Hastings, the then Governor General of India, makes a remark: "If it be really true the British arms and influence have suffered so severe a check in the Western world, it is more in- incumbent upon those who are charged with the interest of Great Britain in the East to exert themselves for the retrieval of the national honor." The novel depicts the emasculation and alienation of royalty from their people through an ingenious British scheme, the subsidiary alliance, which reduced the princely states to mere golden honeycombs, while the British had all the authority to snatch the honey whenever they wish. Characters of the Golden Honeycomb. Baji Rao Van is the king of Deepur, a princely state of India. He is struggling against the increasing power of the British forces as he tries to side with the general public of his state. He is deposed for his seditious activities against the British government. Diwan is a shrewd minister of Baji Rao Van. Baji Rao II is a young man of the ruling class who is picked by the British government as the new king of Deepur. Baji Rao II has no real power in his hands but he is allowed to have all possible amenities in return for being a puppet in the hands of the British administration. The British government appoints a British resident to overlook the administration of Deepur. Manjula is wife of Baji Rao II. Baji Rao III is the only son of Manjula and Baji Rao II who becomes the king after his father's untimely death at a very young age. Baji Rao III is raised and indoctrinated under the British influence and he proves to be a perfect vessel of the British government. Mr Barrington is the English tutor of Baji Rao III. Colonel Arthur is the British resident of Deepur who keeps a strong hold over Baji Rao III. Shanta Bai is the queen wife of Baji Rao III who gives birth to three daughters. Mohini is an attractive commoner maid of the queen who grabs the eyes of the king. Baji Rao III proposes Mohini to become his second wife but she declines claiming that Baji Rao III is not a king even in his own house he is just a puppet Rabindranath or Rabi is the son of Baji Rao III and Mohini being his only son Rabi becomes the heir prince of Deepur Sophia is the daughter of a British agent summary of the golden honeycomb The novel begins with a prologue in which the author explains the premise of the period from 1850 to 1947 during which the Indian subcontinent was under the oppressive influence of the British government. The prologue depicts clearly the British policy to keep India as its prized colony for its power as well as economic prosperity. The author highlights the commercial mindset of the East India Company and its subtle in- intriguing ways to hold on to India and conquer its princely states one by one. One such state is Deepur. The king of Deepur is Maharaj Baji Rao Van, who is a self-indulgent, irresponsible and vain person lacking a strong individualistic character. However, he doesn't like the British intervention in the administrative manner of Deepur as it makes him realize how little power he actually holds. Thus, he tries to restrict the interventions of the East India Company. The British government, which is gradually taking over the role of the ruler of India while replacing the East India Company and the princely states, decides to get rid of Maharaja Baji Rao I and he is deposed for his seditious activities.
The Diwan of Deepur hobnobs with the British agent and suggests the name of an 18 years old young man belonging to the ruling class as the new king. The British agent accepts the idea because he believes that the new king will be no more than a puppet under the influence of the British administration. The young man is anointed as Bajirao II, the king of Deepur. Originally, he was a commoner, the son of a landlord who is just married to Manjula, a girl of 13. Now he is the king of Deepur with all possible amenities available for him. However, he is neither free nor happy. It becomes a duty of his to wear the robes of, of the king and attend the darbar as a mere vassal of the British Empire as all the major decisions are to be taken by the British agent. He continues to enjoy the richness of the darbar and soon his wife gives birth to his son, Bajirao III. The new prince is raised under British influence and he gets English tutors and indoctrination. Maharaja Bajirao II wishes his son to thoroughly imbibe the British culture but Maharani Manjula opposes him and says that he must learn about his own country and culture first. The British agent ensures that the queen has no say in the prince's life. The prince knows nothing about Deipur and India, but he learns the history and geography of England. He learns about the British constitution, laws, customs and mannerisms and learns about the British generals and statesmen who rule over a third of the world. Unfortunately, Bajirao II meets an accident while hunting and dies. His son is announced as the new king Bajirao III while the British agent becomes the caretaker. Bajirao III hardly gets any idea of India as his nation or Devpura as his state. He grows up in the best of the leisures and amenities and then is sent to the chief's college for higher education. Chief's College is a special institution founded by the British government to educate and civilize the sons of Indian princes and noblemen to inculcate British ways in them. The Chief's College is designed to function as the Indian Alton. This further alienates Bajirao III from his people and he thoroughly becomes a British vassal. Bajirao III becomes the favorite student of his English tutor, Mr. Barrington, who praises him highly and writes a favorable testimonial describing him as a fine horseman, an excellent shot, a first-class cricketer and unrivaled at polo. The British agent keeps a close watch on Bajirao III to keep everything under control. Bajirao III praises everything British and he ridicules and hates his own culture and people. Maharani is completely alienated from her son, so much so that she is not allowed to select the bride for her son. Divan again shows his shrewdness and suggests Shanti Bai as a match for Vajirao III who is liked by Maharani and British agent both. He gets married to Shanti Bai, chosen by the British agent. Shanti Bai gives birth to three daughters. Bajirao III continues to be the perfect puppet in the hands of the British agent. He is the ruler of Deipur with no power to rule. Shanti Bai is a traditional Indian woman whom Bajirao III doesn't like very much. She gives birth to three daughters. Bajirao III wishes to have a son to be his heir. He falls for a common girl Mohini who becomes his mistress. Bajirao III wishes to marry Mohini but she declines the proposal as she realizes that he is not a free man. Mohini gives birth to a son and demands that he should be recognized as the heir of Bajirao III without her marrying the Maharaj. She insists that though the Maharaj is not a free man within his own palace, her son will lead a life of freedom. She names the prince Rabi Nath and calls her Rabi with love. Since Rabi is not the official son of Bajirao III, Mohini succeeds in avoiding the unwanted attention of the British agent in the life and growth of his son. She appoints a Pandit as an Indian tutor for Rabi as he grows old. Despite Bajirao III's wish to send Rabi to the chief's school and the chief's college like a prince, Rabi's mother and his grandmother ensures that he gets his education in Indian manners. The Pandit, with the help of Mohini and Maharani Manjula, inculcates Indian values in Rabi who learns the glorious past, past of India and how the foreign rulers are now devastating his nation. He learns about the heroic deeds of his ancestors and understands the value of individual freedom and the cultural identity. 
Being the son of Mohini, a commoner, Ravi lacks the vanity and pride of Baji Rao III. He plays with Das, the son of a servant, and enjoys his time with Janaki, a sweeper girl. He has no inhibitions of caste and class, and he learns to love the people of the empty belly race. When Baji Rao III sees Rabi playing with Janaki and Das, he dismisses Das's father and Janaki from their jobs. Rabi protests against his this as he wants the freedom to choose his friends. Life goes on and Rabi continues to understand the situation of his father as a vessel of the British agent. Maharani Shanti Devi notices that Rabi is becoming a rebel, rebel who doesn't like his father being a mere servant of British rulers. She further explains how everybody has sold their soul to the Britishers. She says that Bajirao III is proud of his legacy as the king of Depur, but in reality he is just a slave of the British rulers. Rabi then learns why he was alienated from Janaki and Das. He understands that being the son of a slave, he too is a slave with no freedom to choose his companions. However, he doesn't yet realize the extent of slavery of his father. Bajirao III insists Rabi join his darbar as the Iyer Prince. Rabi agrees to it half-heartedly and then he learns the true extent of the submissiveness of Bajirao against the British agent. This fills him with hatred towards his own father. As Rabi goes, grows old, he starts learning about the world outside the walls of the palace. He learns about the hardship of the common people. He decides to take sides with the mill workers, protesting against the inhuman conditions in the mills for the workers. Rabi meets Sophia, the daughter of a British agent, and Sophia notices the fire of individual freedom in Rabi's eyes. She starts appreciating him. Both of them are on the opposite side of the political fulcrum. Both were aware of the troubled alliance that existed between the British and the Indians and of the boundary between them that they were forbidden to cross. But all this changes one night when during the revelries of a village festival, the two find themselves passionately drawn to each other. Realizing what is at stake, the lovers dare to defy every rule of class and race. Baji Rao decides to take Rabi to the Grand Dahli Darbar where he has been invited to attend the meeting in honor of the ceremony of the crowning of His Majesty King Emperor Edward in 1903. Mohini opposes Rabi from going to Delhi and insists that unlike his father, Rabi is not a slave of the British Empire. However, Baji Rao manages to persuade her to allow Rabi to go with him. Baji Rao is very excited because he loves Darbar and especially the Delhi Darbar. After all, it allows him to feel as being linked with the King Emperor of Britain, his beloved nation. He believes that as the representative of the people of Depur, he can express the loyalty of all people of Depur towards the Viceroy and the King Emperor. At the Delhi Darbar, Rabi sees his father bowing three times against Lord Kurjan, the Viceroy of India. Lord Kurjan treats Baji Rao coldly and this fills Rabi with hatred. He realizes that the Maharaj has no power and respect in the Darbar. He is powerless. He learns that all the power is held by Lord Curzon, while Baji Rao is only his vessel. Rabi makes up his mind and decides to join the non-violent protests against the British Empire. On their return, Rabi actively starts taking part in social services and he devotes himself to the cause of the Indian freedom struggle. He makes distance himself from Sophia. Once a group of peasants and laborers decides to stage a protest against increased levies and taxes, they forcefully stop the car of Maharaj and to request him to take back the order of increased taxes. Rabi appears as the leader of the mob and asks Baji Rao to rescind the order of increased levies and treaties that cannot be supported by the poor peasants and laborers. Baji Rao says that he is the prince and heir of Depur and that his actions will ruin the state. Rabi exclaims that he is against monarchy and wishes India to be a free democratic state. While Baji Rao is not happy with the freedom struggle, Rabi continues to increase his contribution to the revolution. 
India achieves independence and the princes of India were left with two choices. They had to sign the instrument of accession and accede to either to India or to Pakistan. By participating in the national freedom movement, Rabi wins popularity and helps to bridge the gulf between the ruler and the ruled. So this is it for today. We will continue to discuss the history of Indian English literature. Please stay connected with the discourse. Thanks and regards.